Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Good. Hope you're doing good. Um, you can check out the notes and the assignment. I think for the rest of the class, they might be joining us soon. And I'll go over the notes and the assignment shortly, okay? So this week, we are going to cover chapter six. Hi, Jarrell, how are you? All right, so as I was saying, uh, you can check out your notes and your assignment. <clears throat> I'll share the videos um, after I download the recording and upload it on YouTube. And then we'll work on the lab um, on Wednesday. So in this week, we're going to move into information gathering as the first step of pen testing. Um, and it introduces to you a different type of search engine that you can use to gather some information and how we can also use Python and Python library in order to obtain um, some resources. So. For the first part, it talks about Shodan, and this is a search engine that allows us to look at all the connected servers, the systems, um, your camera, IP camera, your um, industrial control systems, and so on. So when you visit the link, you will see this. And this is a search engine that you can use. You can simply type in the criteria here. But if you're looking for certain ports or something like that, you can also find some information. We'll work on that. When you visit the website, it tells you that it, unlike the other search engine, we are going to be able to find power plants, mobile phones, refrigerators, uh, servers, and so on. OK? This is used to be able to track the devices, especially if you have things that are always connected to the internet. And we can use it to really see how vulnerable they are or how secure they are. And 
in the analysis of this, we're able to get some uh, report so that way we can come back and be able to see how we can improve our systems and how it's connected to the rest of our network. So using the search engine, there is an area for developers. So you can use Ruby, Python, Node.js, and PHP. And in this class, since we're covering Python, you can implement API in order to be able to use it. Um, now, in order to search effectively, you have to have an account. So it gives you a certain amount of search for free. And then any additional, you will have to pay for the subscription. OK, that allows them to really maintain this. So in the first part of the notes, it talks about what Shodan is and um, how it can be used to identify the vulnerabilities of your systems and your servers. It also allow you to examine and monitor your IoT devices or devices that are connected to the internet. There are several ways that you can access Shodan. You can use the web interface where you would visit the site. That's what we've seen. You can also implement RESTful API in your script. Um, we can do that from writing Python script. And we can also use module that allows us to acquire certain information and we would use a module called Shodan. And you can visit the module information here. So on the, on the development side, you would see that you would need to, you can integrate it. You can use it to automate things like for monitoring. You can also get notifications. Um, you have access to IP information, DNS information, and the data. So in the in the information gathering process, a lot of the times we have to find out, right, the type of devices that are connected, um, how are they susceptible to attacks and things like that. So in the first question, it asks you, how can you use Shodan to gather information about internet connected devices or web servers? We can use it in three ways. We can simply visit the website and use the web interface. And then we would need to log in and be able to set filter um, and access certain content that we're looking for. The second area is we can implement API and simply that is a program that will be connected to another program. So it is the middleman between us our application and Shodan. Then we can also write the script using Python and we would implement Shodan module. Either way, you would have to create or register for an account. And on the development end, you would be able to get developer Shodan key to be able to implement that with your script. OK. So those are the three ways we can use Shodan, web interface, RESTful API, and Python script using Shodan module. Now, to make an account, step two walks you through the process. You can visit this link. And in order to do some exercises in the assignment in the lab, we will need to have an account. You can use your RCCD email. I think they do have the educational option. So you can make free account and be able to use, but that will be limited to the number of searches that you are acquiring. Once you have registered for the account by filling out the information, you will need to, um, let me click the link. You will need to validate your account. OK, so I already created the account. You just have to sign up and then access your email to validate. Once that happened, you can log in and it will look something like this. OK. Now. It walks you through the simple process, like what it is, how to use it with filter and query. 
and then how to work with the files. So you can click learn more if you want to access some information on how to use it. And then also how to use network monitoring options on it and be able to watch the videos. On the developer access, you would see on how to download data with the API, how to look up. So they have some resources on how you can use it. Now, just like any kind of tool that we use, we need to make sure that we install it. So this is the instruction for Linux. And it walks you through on how to use it with an API. So where do I access my API information? Okay. If you go to the developers, oh, okay. And then on the top right, it should give you the option on show API key. That is the key that is generated once you create the account. And you can also click on the account and it will show you your API key. Okay, so to integrate API, you have to be able to use the API key. And if you wanna come back to regular dashboard, you just click show done and you can always click developer and be able to see your key. So we can filter some of the areas using Shodan here. They give you some example like devices in certain city, devices in certain country or open ports in certain country. Um, you can look at the hack website or certain type of website like vulnerable website like FTP sites. You can also look at your IP range or your CIDR information that will just coming back to the, the network identifier, the public IP. You can also find organizations and their IP space like Google. We can look at ports, specific ports that is used to run certain type of devices. We can also look at the type of product based on the vendor, like for example, Samsung Smart TV. So from an attacker standpoint, they can use this to gather information about the type of system that's connected to an enterprise or even at a certain location. Um, and then we can look at certain state, for example, devices in Texas or California, so here it shows you how you can also implement filter where you would be able to narrow down certain type of information about the devices that are connected. So unlike Google Chrome, this search engine is focused specifically on just the internet connected devices like your smart devices. And how we would use it would be for monitoring purposes for the device that we connect and also the type of systems that we enable to like your web servers and other type of servers that you are using in your network. So in the second step, <clears throat> sorry, it shows you how to register for an account. And then once you register, you would access your email to verify your account. It will give you the link and then you simply re-log back in using the username and password that you created. And you should be able to click on the API key to see the API key or QR code. And you should be able to see that, okay? And this is required in order to effectively use Shodan. Um, and in the process of, you know, doing pen testing or ethical hacking, you have to start with information gathering. And that takes up a lot of resources and time. So <clears throat> instead of searching it on your regular search engine, we can narrow it down and filter it using Shodan search engine. Okay, any question? Okay, so for exercise two, we simply create an account. Now, in the next section here, it talks about REST API and how that can be used. So we need to make sure that we have an API key and we can specify the criteria that we wanna search. So 
whatever that you can do on the interface, you will likely be able to do that using Python script. All you have to do is to make sure that your API key is valid and we would specify that. So hold on one second, let me go into the example one so I can show you. So in the first example, this shows you how to be able to implement Shodan module. And here we also use the OS library or the module. And when you write this script, you would first need to declare your object, which is uh, going to contain your API key. And here we want to use os.environment so that will come from the module. And when you do this, you need to make sure that your API key is the actual key that's going to go into this quotation mark. Okay. And then we can print that out if we want to show the API key. Then after that, we would use an object that we create and it's going to access the module showed on. Here, it's going to instantiate the object class, which is under showed on. And it's going to pass the actual key that you previously declare into the parameter. Now, like all the things that we use for HTTP or web-based programming, we can implement try and accept to handle the exception in the case where we would come across issues. So in this example, our result is going to be storing the devices in the category of NGINX. So this is a type of system that is widely implemented for um, in the internet for connection, okay? And when we print, we simply want to bring down the information that it gathers from the search. And we want to itemize that using the items method. In the case that it's not able to get the information, it will print out the error or the exception, okay? So writing something like this will allow you to implement the API in, in order to search for something. And that will be the same as using the web interface and we will put this into the search field and search for this type of device or system. Okay, any question? So for example one, right, um, or for this first part, we would see that, and this comes from the actual documentation, you can also implement something like this. We can import in the class itself, which is showed on from the module. We just need to create a very, uh, an object that's gonna be instantiated under that class and it's gonna have the actual key. So in here, you have to, to copy and paste your key over. And if we're looking for a certain host with the public IP, you simply just specify that in the parameter. So here we have a variable that's gonna hold the host information that's gonna use the IP address. And then we simply print that, okay? Now, if you're searching for a hacked website, right, because a lot of the times those websites, the hacker would sign the website saying it's hacked by and then their handle. So what you can do is you can seek a banner which contains information about a certain system. And in that banner, you might have a text content for, for HTTP. So here in the next part, you can search for the hacked website by using a for loop. And we would search through, right, using elements of the banner to be able to look for a string that would be including the signature for the hacker, hacked by so-and-so. 
and we can print that out. Another area that we can search for is we can search for the control systems. And these ICSs exist for automated purposes, for industrial control, right? And with things like power plants and grids, you would see that industrial system is implemented using or, or connected and we can use Shodan to be able to find them. So here in this section, we create a variable called I, ICS services. And this is gonna go through and it's gonna iterate through the list of ICSs by looking for the tag ICS. And it will be able to print out, right, the type of industrial systems that you would have and the number, okay? Now, this doesn't really narrow down on uh, some of the other filter, like the country, the state, and so on, and you would have to implement those type of filters by specifying them. But it would be the same as if I use Shodan like this, right? And I would be able to click Explore. And in here, there are different categories that I can look for, like video games, databases, infrastructure. So in that section, we would then go to I ICS, which links you to a second or a third page, right, under the Shodan. And in ICS, you can see that there's SCADA, PLC, Program Logic Controller, and Distributed Control System. And here are some of the companies that are affiliated with those. Okay. So what we can do is we can narrow down. So if you want to really look at the filter, you can click on here. And that is going to give you the tag ICS. That will be the same section as what you, you've seen previously. Okay. All right, any question? Now, um, so this gives you a little bit of how to be able to implement the searches using um, Python. Now, for example, too, what we would see is that we can look for a specific domain and its IP address, and we can implement Shodan. Okay, so here we would have request library, Shodan library, and OS. And again, just like before, you would have a declaration of an object that's going to hold your API key, and without it, you can't you can't search or filter your search. So you have to implement the API if you're using a script. And then after that, we will instantiate the class object that's gonna pass the key parameter just like before. So we would then create a variable to set up our endpoints, which is gonna be the domain, uh, fully qualified domain name. And on this one, you would see that it uses DNS resolve. So we would have to resolve that and be able to show the IP. It's like looking up python.org, right? Using NSLOOKUP, and that's what this does. So here we would print out the request response from that domain. This is what you've seen with the request library from the prior chapters. And then we can print out the IP. And the good thing about this is you can take things and put it into JSON, like what we talked about before. And as the data is in a list, you have to iterate through it. So that way you can access the port and the data. Okay. As you know, that packets are passed across the networks to from system to other networks, right? So it would list the type of ports and so on. So in that section, we would see the exception handling. Now, Shodan module, it has some of the built-in functionality or the functions such as search method that would be able to give you the connected system 
uh, or seek a certain connected system. So like what we've seen here, right? If we're looking for that type of system, we would use the search method, okay? And this comes from the Showdown library. Any question? Now, as you use the module, you will have to install the module, right? In any type of system, you can use pip. That's the easiest way. Of course, in Linux, you can do sudo app install in the module name if you're using Debian release. But it, even in Windows, you would then be able to use pip3 install showdown. Now, if you if you simply do this on command prompt, it will not be able to link this library to all your Python stuff. So it's best to do a virtual environment and then install it onto your virtual environment. So that way it is accessible for that virtual machine for Python and you can run your script that way. So you, you have an option to do that. So if you're using Windows, you simply activate the virtual environment and I'll walk you through that in a later exercise or you can use a Linux virtual machine. And so when I wrote this, I suggest that, you know, if you have a Linux virtual machine that you use in the other lab and, and chapters, you can use that. So um, I have a Linux virtual machine here. And then I can simply access the terminal, okay? And then I would do a pip3 install, right, showdown. Now, if you don't have pip install, then you would have to do sudo app install pip in the case of Ubuntu or Debian release. And as you can see, I already installed this. So it tells me that it's already been satisfied. But once you do this, it should download and be able to install the module for you. Okay. With that, we would then be able to write our script, okay? So here, as I explained earlier, we are gonna do this script. Now you can use, if you're using the virtual machine, like a Linux virtual machine, you can use Nano or you can use its text editor to be able to write this. So we simply import in the class, right? Um, from Shodan library. And then when we create this object API, this is the Shodan object uh, class object, we have to make sure that you would need to replace this with your actual API key. And that's why you have to do step two. So again, to find your API key, you would need to log in to Shodan after you register, you would click developer and you should see it on the right top corner. Okay, any question? Okay, so let me come back to my terminal. Actually, let me open up the file for you. Okay, so we would add in our API here, make sure it's in the quotation mark and then save it and run and run. After you do that, you would then need to take a screen capture and you should be able to see the number of systems that are or ICS system that are found. 
So it will be the same as using the interface to just give you a summary of the number of ICS that are connected. Let me see. So after you created your script using nano, so for example, I can do nano um, U6EX4 search. I think that's what it's called. There we go. So after you put in your actual key, you can save it, right? So control X, yes, and then enter. And then we would issue the Python 3 command to run it in Python, U6EX4I. Okay, so with that, I didn't want to show my API key, so I have a second file, right? You're going to see a lot of data that's going to come through here, okay? So it's going to list the, the um, different types of systems are connected as uh, we put that in your in your um in your script i think i have the wrong one run here that is exercise three okay one second That's the one. Okay, so I can show them start that PY. And when you look at this, you're going to see that it tells you, right, host name information port information, IP, um, and then it's going to do the HTTP. <clears throat> so the total number of <clears throat> ICS that I'm able to recover from that script is going to be 102,902 devices here. Okay, and then prior to that, you would see also country information for some of the, the devices. Um, so a lot of the content are coming through. And again, if you're doing this in, in a terminal, you can just do a nano and then the file name make sure that you plug in the actual API key and then so that way you can run it. Otherwise, it's going to throw an error. And so as we look at this, we simply would know that we can also search for things like your tags. Like if you wanted to look at vulnerable system, you can look at compromise ICS by looking at this, okay? You can also look at ports. 
you can look at certain region, certain country, and so on. So it allows you to really filter down in your script based on what you want to search it under. <clears throat> so the textbook, they show you how to do this here. And again, simply that they would use that, right? But um, we would be able to use this, the script that that is shown in the exercise itself. Like this. Any question? So now for the next exercise, we would then can find IIS system. And IIS are, it, it is a service in Windows environment. It's equivalent to what you've seen in Apache, right? So it is for web server. IIS is a service that we would use for web server. So in number four, we can use the example one that we see in our notes, and we can create a script that uses Shodan API, and we can search for IS server. And you saw that I ran that. So let me nano it again to open it up for you. 6ex4 IIS search API. So we can simply start with importing Shodan, right? Then we would put in our API key. And after that, we would create the object. Then we are going to do a search. So we would use the search method. So we need to store that into the result and so we can display it. So here we would do an api.search method, and then we will put in the type of system that we're looking for, or in this case, we're looking for the system with this specific service. So if you're looking for a system that is compromised, right, then we would put in the criteria and string here for the parameter. And we want to display the IP. So we would then need to use a for loop to iterate through the matches list. And we can print out the IP and we want to format it. We also wanted to print data. And we would include all of this under the try. And in the exception, we can simply use accept, exception as exception. And then we would print out the error. So I believe I screenshot this to make it larger for you, okay? Oh, sorry, this is, um, should be, let me re-snip it because I modify this because otherwise, if you do it exactly like what the book said, you're going to have an error with the exception. Okay. okay, so that's how you can run a script to gather, right, uh, the information about IIS system. And if you want, you can have it count um, and be able to display the number of IIS that it found.
You can also search for a specific domain using FQDN or the URL. So there are many ways that we can search for things, but using Shodan, it's able to give you specific to the internet connected system, our web servers, our database, our um, ICS, right? Things that power plant would use, uh, smart TV, IP cameras, and so on. So for the cases that you, you hear in the news or when you read an article and it talks about how attackers can find a group of IP cameras, right? Um, that's because we would, they, they would use something like this, right? There are different search engine that they can use to find uh, specific systems that are connected. Any question? So part of the responsibility for pen tester to not only look at the network itself, but to look at systems that are connected to the internet and their vulnerabilities, right? So if you have application servers, databases, uh, web servers, um, IoT devices, um, and so on, you would need to assess them as well. And you can write a script to be able to gather up the information. Any question on this? Okay, so here it talks about showdown module using the search method. You can also find the host information or the system information, right, by using the host method. So we can search for a specific host with specific IP address. Um, or even host name. Okay. And that would be example two. So let's look at that closely. Now, if you're using an IDE like Tani and try to run it, a Shodan module doesn't install well through Tani. So it will be best if you want to run a Python virtual environment in Linux or Windows um, to be able to use this type of tool. Or you can, if you run it on like a Linux virtual machine, like what you've seen, I just pip it. And so I can install it and then run it directly from there. But you know, if you're using an IDE, some IDE doesn't handle a certain module from that package. So um, would need to find other ways to be able to implement it. Now in example two, you also see that this is using uh, requests so this is where it's gonna also use DNS resolve, which is equivalent to what you've seen in DNS lookup. And there's another section that talks about DNS server later on. So in this one, it looked for a specific DNS that would tie to a web server for python.org, okay? And again, we would need to implement IP API in order to run that. Then we can use the host method to be able to print out the host IP. And then we can have it handling the error. I think I might have pasted. Oh yeah, it's right here. Also the host method. 
Okay. So if you create a host variable and use the API, right, you can access the host IP by passing it into the parameter here, and then you can print it. And keep in mind that it's going to be string as if it would show in text. We can also look at, you know, the organization that owned that host. And sometimes the OS is not available, so it would not be able to get the OS information if the OS is not disclosed. So in the case of like PLC or uh, some microcontroller does not use operating system, right? Operating system is only exists in embedded system, right? But so some controller like industrial controllers doesn't have OS, so it will give you OS is not available. But in the case if you're searching for a server, like our case here, right, it would be able to pull the OS if it's allowed to, to review that, okay? Then in the section for the banner, banner contains information about that server, um, such as, you know, production version, uh, the type of server that you're looking at. So some of that can come through as data. And so we can evaluate the port and the uh, banner information. So when you're working using, when you're working to seek information like servers, it's best to look at the request response through the banner. And it would also give you detail on things that are vulnerable as well. So we can seek the general information about that system, like the connection information the OS is, and also how it is requesting and responding. Okay, so that's another example. You can also use it to find like FTP server that's using port 21. So here's another example that you will be able to do that. Now, when I ran this in the my virtual machine, um, I ran into issues with, oh, no, actually it should not give you any issue because this is just the same. I think it's just using different objects here, object name. And then you would specify like the port information and anonymous login. So in this example, it evaluates right all the FTP servers that allows anonymous login using port 21. Now on the, if you understand protocol FTP, if that server allows anonymous login, it has to use common port 21. For the secure FTP, if it requires security for authentication, it would use SS, SSH which is piggyback on top of port 22. So if you're looking for those, then you can specify the port, okay? But in this case, it's looking for port 21, which allows the user to anonymously logging in. So we are gonna seek, right, the port 21 anonymous login. That means that the user can just access it, you know, not having to register for an account. And it would put that user as an anonymous user, right? Some website, you would click on that option and it would take you to the FTP. Uh, it would give you the FTP links to download or upload and so on. And as it comes through with the list, especially for the matches with IP, we would then need to be able to loop through it and we can append it into the results so we can print it. And we wanna show our server information for the second for loop. Now, showed on, on the web interface, you would see um, filter option, okay? So if you look at this section right here on its dashboard, 
right? If you click on search query fundamental, here they show you how you can implement those field, right, filter. And this is dictionary based. So you want to have the key and the value. If you, you know, this example show that you're looking for a certain type of data, right, certain IP, certain port number, organization, location, country, and so on. And some of the properties that you can implement are these. Now, depending on the type of system that you're seeking and if it's lively connected, it should give you the response like this. But if it's not connected or something has changed on it, you're not gonna get the result back, of course. Okay. So you can narrow down your search a little deeper by looking at like the type of data, the, the IP, the port and so on based on the five filters. Any question? So that gives you like a brief, basic fundamental query information. So there's some links here that you can use, right? You can look at things in a map view, you can search or you can set up your network monitoring and then also your filter cheat sheet. Okay, an example. So they do a good job of putting together this dashboard, make it easy for the user to access um, compared to other type of search engine. All right, so let's do the next part after number four. We can uh, use Shodan web interface and be able to filter. So I wanna show you what that looked like, right? And you can put in the criteria, okay? So we would, log in the website, okay? And the first time, or when you log in, it's gonna look like this. It's gonna show the dashboard. Then you can click explore, or you can just type in the search criteria, but we will click explore and it brings you to the categories of our system. We would, for this exercise, we are gonna search for industrial control system. So we are gonna click here. So those things control nuclear power plants, uh, you know, water systems, uh, so on, okay? So that would include SCADA, PLC, and all of these type of system. So after we click on your industrial control system category, we're gonna put in the port value into your search bar like this. And we're gonna click it. So this gives you the overall report, right? You would have 614 and it gives you the overall maps on which country has the most. So we would see that United States have 235 ICS that's using this port value compared to other countries. China is the next ranking and so on. And if you look in the middle, you would see that it would tell you, right, the IP, what kind of system it is. Some are honeypot and some are not. 
these are the ICS. This is the cloud honeypot. Okay, so when we're seeking that port, it doesn't necessarily give you just the ICS. It also gives you other type of system if it's cloud-based. Okay. And you can look through it going to the next page and the next page and so on. Now, after we have that, right, we would see how many devices are found in the United States. It gives you the count here. And then if you put your cursor on the map, it also show you, right, for US. And then if we look at China, right, if we look at Brazil, if we look at Australia, and so on. Russia has three, okay. Canada has 30. So the United States have 235. Then we are gonna click on the view map to give us a larger map. So here you are gonna click view on map and it would give you this. It might take a little bit to process. It gives you the overall summary again. You can close this, right, as you saw that earlier. And then all of these orange dots just indicated those are the connected system. So if I'm looking at specific country and a specific continent, for example, if we're looking at like um, Germany, right, it will be here. And again, it shows you for this part. And we can go back. I forgot to answer that question with you. So click on view map. And you should see the top company organizations that use these. So here it tells you service provider corporation. A lot of them are cloud, right? And so these are some of the number of the corporations that use these. Okay, like Cloud VSP. So once you have it on the map, it tells you the type of organization. We can see other things through historical trend. So when we go back, we can click on historical trend. This gives you the details on how many, right, from months ago to more recent. So we do see some decreasing. So two years ago, we have a escalation of 32, right? And then eventually we would have less. So currently, right, as of February, not in March, um, you would see that it's at 676 total for this port. Okay, so we're not saying all of them, just that part. And then it also gives you the ranking in each of the countries. Okay. So based on that, we can see that, what is the trend for the number of devices from 12 months ago? So from 12 months ago, we were at 700. So it, there's like about 3.5% reduction compared to a year ago. So this is great because it gives you the overall analysis, right, of, and statistic information. Okay. And then there's also a feature where you can, you know, you can move things to a certain month and so on. So if we're looking at October, 2021, right? We're at 292 in the United States and then China was 68. 
and Brazil was at 21. So you have added devices um, in the United States for that particular report. Then we can go into the view report, so we can click back to actually go here. Let me do that again. Go to view report. So then here we would see the overall, like what we've seen in the other pages. It gives you the map. It also gives you the organization. But on this one, it gives you the detail, right? Um, your service provider corporation, those are like the Comcast, some of the other companies um, for telecommunication also. That would be 91. And then your cloud and so on. So. And the tags that we use when we search for those ports are ICS, Cloud, Honeypot, and CDN. So those are the type of system that uses this port value, okay? So you see that more abundant with the ICS, the cloud servers, the Honeypot, and the CDN. And so if we want to look at a specific group of systems, the type of system in, in on the report, right, uh, we would see those, okay? So the honeypot, we would see about 102 compared to cloud and also the ICS has the most, okay? Now, how does this number translate to what we see? It gives you a less number right here. Okay. So what you would see is that some of these are in various country and belongs to certain organization and so on. So now it tells you that there's no, no information on vulnerabilities. It does not mean that there's no vulnerability, but just the vulnerabilities are not known for these groups of systems. And also we don't see operating system as some of these are not able to disclose the OS even though they're cloud or, you know, or they could also be microcontrollers. Okay, any question regarding Shodan? So I think before you build a script to really search and narrow down the search, you have to understand how that search engine work and the best way is to really interface with it and explore. And so the, the search criteria and things that you put in that could be implemented as filter, right? And the methods that you use in the actual script itself. Okay, so as you dig a little deeper, you can say, okay, this is what I would write as a function to be able to implement this criteria. Um, so that this gives you the overall perspective on how to really narrow it down from the web interface. And then so when you do it in the script, you would actually see the equivalent of that. Okay. Any question? And in addition to Shodan, we have another search engine. Okay, so before we do exercise six, let's take a look at Binary Edge. And Binary Edge contains domain-related services in real time, very similar to Shodan, but it's able to narrow down more specifics 
And if you're using the free version, you're only able to get up to 250 requests in when you implement an API. You can also find ASNs. These are autonomous system numbers. Um, if you have taken 30B before, we've seen ASN via the cloud when we're using Azure or AWS. <clears throat> so when you're using cloud-based systems or cloud servers, right, that use this ASN, it's able to do that to pass to things quickly for regions or, you know, so that way when someone is in another continent, it can locate the closest data center with the or the quickest ASN that's going to pass them to the closest data center compared to if, you know, passing continents, because the longer you are in distance from that data center, the more if you pass it through multiple um, um, communication system, it will cost more. So that's why cloud companies implemented this so that way it can narrow down to the local data center for that specific company. And when you write the script in Python, you can use a library called Pi Binary Edge. And again, if we're using this tool, we have to install it using pip. Okay. So just like Shodan, you have to create an account and you can use that account to be able to obtain your API key. And so in the example three, it shows you similar to what you've seen in Shodan, but in this case, we would use a different library. We can import in its class binary edge. We would create an object that stored the key. We would pass that key when we instantiate binary edge object. And we can search for specific things like a domain. And we can print out the IP information. So this library supports the different method like the whole search and whatever that you put into the parameter, it's going to be able to write seek for that. Okay, any question? Okay, so let's pause there and come back to the assignment. Number six walks you through the step on how to use binary edge web interface. So in order to use it, you have to also create a login, just like what we've done with Shodan. Let me close this and this. So after you register for an account by clicking sign up, you fill out the information using your school email or an email, and then you have to access that email to validate your account. Once you validate the account, you can re-log in and you would see this, okay? You can search for host, images, data leaks, uh, you know, torrent, so it's going to go into tor and be able to get some information, domain, sensors, okay. And then even subdomains. And I think the book touches on how you can write the script to be equivalent to this. So when you use the example three, what you're doing is you're doing a search for the domain, correct? So that's like clicking on that tab and putting in python.org like this. Okay. So with this, it gives you subdomains to python.org. 
right? And so here we can see that there are 75 entries when we're searching for that domain. So it basically, it enumerates and gather the subdomain information and be able to give you that as an, a result output. And that will be equivalent to, let me see. We'll talk about the DNS dissolver. Okay, any question? Okay, so once we're in binary edge, after you create an account and log in, you are going to click the ICS checkbox. The reason why I chose that is I wanted to, for you to see right under the host, how is it different than your Shodan? Okay, so if you select the ICS, you are going to see, right, some of the ports that are used for the ICS, the countries that are affiliated with these devices, and the vendor or the product information. You on the right, you would also see ASN, right, like AT&T, Salco, Comcast. So a lot of these ASN belong to almost all ASN belong to the telecommunication company, okay? And so here we're just using the tag keyword, ICS, when you check that box, and then it will list, right, various country and the system that belongs to that particular region or area. So this tells you more right, on the product and then the category and so on. So it looks a little different. Now, just to play around, we can click on malware, okay? And then we would see like rat, backdoor, so on. And where that's communicating from, we will see some of these ASN passing through. Okay, and that can be tracked with packets. So as you can see, right, it's able to see that China got like 118 entry for dark comet. And then, you know, the Optics Pro backdoor, you would see 61 in the countries that's impacted here. So this is a good engine to also seek, you know, malware, database, IoT, camera, and so on. So in our, our exercise, we simply click ICS. And here we would see how many of the ICS are found. And based on the result, we would see for United States, it will be 46,279. Now, this is a large number comparing to what you've seen before in the other Shodan engine is because we look for certain port value, where in this case, we are not looking for a certain port value. It listed all the ports here, right? So ICS doesn't necessarily that it has to be that port, right? 200,000, it should be other ports as well. So we would answer this question, what are the associated ports in the ICS? So we can say, of course, because it's web oriented, you would have 80, TCP 80, TCP 1911, TCP 502, and so on. Okay. 8080, that's common with web and 80 is common. And then you have some of the, the other port values. So put those down for that answer, okay, for this one.
Now, if you want to find out, right, what type of system uses that certain port, for example, this one, you can click on it and it will tell you the products, the countries, and the ASN. So the way this is, is it's updating, it's a live database, right, of all this information. And that's how you are able to query when you click on it or you specify the, the filter criteria here for your query. So I'm looking for this part when I click on it, right, and the protocol is TCP. So it tells me that there are 43,573 entries. And these are the type of products. These are the countries where they exist and the ASN that, that connects them. Okay, so you can list the type of products that you will find. So we can narrow down. And why do we care about these products? It's because you would have vulnerability that's associated with certain vendor whether it's firmware or unpatched things and so on. So that way you can narrow down, right? And research that specific vendor or product. Then now what we're gonna do is we can manually specify the port instead of clicking on it. So we're gonna go ahead and click back. Or you can actually just okay. you can clear this and then you can clear and then type in port 80, check ICS, and it is like clicking on that, but let me try it again. Then we're going to click database. So we're looking for web database using HTTP under TCP. So here we would see that with port 80, these databases are tied to other port values and you would see like MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres and others, right? And MySQL products is common in United in United States and other countries as well. So you have like well over four million. Now, when you're looking at the ASN, you have the AWS or Amazon, right? And then this is Alibaba is for China, and then also other right here, France, U.S. So we can identify how many MySQL database using port 80 and how many AWS ASN or autonomous system numbers that are connected in the United States for that. So for port 80, we would have this many for Amazon. It uses Amazon O2. Okay. Then we can also clear the search. We can search for other device like IP cameras. So we can clear this and you can simply select camera. And so you would more commonly see like 8,000, port 80, 81, 80, 80 for IP cameras. Okay. 
Okay. You see quite a bit for Vietnam and China, Mexico, and so on. So after you select the camera, you can list the ports that you find. Okay, some of the ports don't show up for me on the table. Okay, make sure you clear this, right? And then you, if you're looking at IP camera, select that. Okay. Refresh the page and see Jarrell. Sometimes it takes a little bit to load. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't load it right away because it's still pulling it, depending on also connection too. So... Okay, so here you would see, why is it so abundant in China? They use a lot of CCTV stuff, right? Um, and then also Korea, you would see Korea also here. So in United States, if you click United States, it gives you the actual IP and the systems for United States. So this is where people find your IP cameras. Okay. And that funnels through like Charter, UNET, Comcast, so some of the major telecommunication company. Okay. And so for us, for United States, we would have about six, 670,000. And then it gives you the breakdown for that. Okay, so list the ports that you found. And as you play with this, it gets more interesting if you put in like some of the criteria, you look for things. Um, and so, when in the industry, there is a high need in, in managing the IoT security, right? Um, in how it's connected, um, how updates it can be, maintaining that along with testing it. But because it's publicly connected, a lot of the times we waver some of the security area in order for things to work or in order for things to communicate. And as we look into the type of system that we're connecting today, smart systems, we have to think about how we can protect it um, and what people see when they're looking or seeking it, right? These type of search engine is not normally what a common person would look at, but the technically inclined people that are looking for things could be for malicious or non-malicious intent they can view this information as these things are publicly available. So with that in mind, we really have to see what is available, what kind of resources are available for us to really protect our system against the people who don't or have the intention to access those systems. Okay. So these are the two search engine that you would see would use to be able to access domain sensors. So you can even look at sensors. There's so many different types. And on the industrial area, you would see a lot. It could be robotic related. It could be for automation, so many things, okay? Like honey pots and sensors. Look at Belize though. 
105. Wow. Okay. Compared to the United States, we're in the millions still, Monaco. Okay, and so on. And the tags that use this, you can see RDP, you already know what that is, HTTP, UPN, SSL, and so on. Okay, and then you can also view some of the payload information. Here are the images for various things. You got mobile VNC, right? Or remote desktop, Windows, and so on. So it's able to capture some of the images. Okay. So after we finish with that, you can close your binary itch search engine. And so when we write our script, we would use the Pi binary edge, which is the library that we can use to implement a uh, search for binary edge. Okay, so before we answer that, let's take a look at this. Okay, there's an example for socket. Oh, before we go into that, let's talk about banners. So here, um, as I touched on earlier, we talked about banner, but here it defines banners, right? What it is, so you can use it mostly for web server to really access version and name. So whenever you work with like Apache IIS, um, HTTP based server, we know that there's specific common technologies that they use like Java, PHP, Python, and so on. So when you access the banner, all that is is going to contain information about that web server, like its name, its production version, public, mostly that we're interested in what's being available in public. And then um, we can use socket module to look at the request and response, just like what we've done in week three to be able to evaluate, right, the details of that web server. Okay. Now, going back to the Pi, the Pi binary edge, you can um, install it using PIP3, but like I said, it's best if you create a virtual environment. So how do I do that? Because some of you know how already, because you had my class a few times for the 30 series. But if you don't know how, in any of the OS command line, right, you, if you have the Python 3 install, you can use Python 3 dash M. And then this right here allows you to create a virtual environment and then whatever the name of it is. So in this case, I'm using PENV, you can say lab ENV or assignment ENV, assignment dash ENV, whatever you wanted to call it, you would name that here. Okay, so that's the first step is to create the virtual environment for Python. If you're using Windows, what you need to do after that is you're going to activate it because even if you create it, you will not be able to access it until you activate it, okay? So I'm gonna do this for the example for you. So if I open up my command prompt and I do this, right? It's gonna take like about a minute for it to go. So what it does is it's gonna take a location in your system and it's gonna create that virtual environment called PENV or PENV like this, okay? And since I'm using Windows PC, I need to activate it using a dot bat. And there's another way that you can do it with another command. So once I activate it, notice that it puts the, the parentheses around the name of my virtual environment. Even though 
it's showing the same path in my C. What it does, it creates a folder under this path and it uses that directory to link my Python and any of the associate library that I installed inside that folder. So this is a way that you can organize it and, and keep everything in the same path, okay? You can also set up system path and, and making sure everything linked manually, but doing it this way. So from here on out, what I can do is I can do this. I can do a pip3 install, uh, pi, what is it, binary edge like this, right? And so it's going to be able to pull that package and install it inside this virtual environment. Okay, it's going slow because of connection and also RAM, right? I'm, I'm you know, but once it goes, it's going to look like this. So this is how you can keep things organized by, by and testing your application by doing the virtual environment like this, okay? So I can install all the packages that I need. It's just gonna link those packages to a directory, right? That is for my virtual environment. And so that way I don't have to hop around and making sure my system path is connected. And so in Linux virtual machine, you can pretty much do the same thing, but instead of using the activate.bat, for your Linux and Mac OS, you would use the source command. So you would do a source PENV slash bin activate. That's how you activate it in your Linux machine. And then after you activate it, you simply just install whatever package that you need or a module that you need, okay? Now, when you're done, you simply type in the command deactivate. What that does, it takes you back to the path for your command line without using, uh, and it's gonna remove, it's gonna take you out of your virtual environment now. So you can program everything directly into the virtual environment through the command line if you do this. Okay. So here, as I'm done, I can simply do deactivate like this and notice that it took out the parentheses here and it brings me back here. So by practice, this is probably, you know, if you're using your system, you should, you know, to test your Python script, you can, you know, you can install things, you can test things by just using the virtual environment this way. And so I put down the steps, but really all you, your answer should be that you would right, um, create the virtual environment, activate the virtual environment, then install your, your Pi binary edge package and then use it there, right? And then when you're done, deactivate your virtual environment. Okay. For question eight, it asks you, why is Banner important in pen testing? And we talked about Banner because Banner contains web server request response information, which consists of server production version, the name. Uh, why is the version important? Because certain version might have vulnerability or it might have you know, issues. So, we want to be able to find out what those, the version, and so if it needs patches. And so version information detected is used to evaluate vulnerability of that server. And so that's why looking at banner is important, right? And you can simply write a script to evaluate the banner using request module. as shown in the notes and the textbook. Any question? So example three shows you how you can do binary edge. Example four shows you how you can use uh, socket module 
you can also use request module socket module to um, access banner. Now this script only works with the text file and in the text file. So make sure that they go together. Okay. In the text file, you simply list, right? Um, the things that you're looking for. So here in the text file, we list the services like open SSH for that Ubuntu. Um, we're looking for a certain version, uh, server version. We're looking for Apache with this vulnerability, right? CVEs are entries of vulnerabilities that are listed. I just went over this with my 27 class earlier today. Um, so Mitre maintains CVE, and if you ever were interested, right, you can look, I think it goes to here, right? So cve.mitre.org. And this lists everyone, including Google, Microsoft, all the companies that, you know, so this is a way that we maintain a database of all the common vulnerabilities. Okay. So here you can see that you can um, look at, they have transitioned some stuff to cve.org. But me try maintain it for a long time since the 80s until now. So you can look at the type of vulnerabilities, um, the organizations that's associated with vulnerabilities like Chromebook, um, Xbox, Microsoft. And these vendors also have their own database that they manage, right? But they would register the CVE records, okay? And then so you can search through and find a common vulnerability after you found some of the details about specific servers, okay? To be able to re, re, uh, remediate that or at least like patch some level of it. Any question? Okay. So this is why we need to evaluate some of the details about our web server, such as version number or production number. Now, there is also another link on the notes. It gives you the internet, uh, internal network security testing. This also derives a list of vulnerability like backdoor Trojan horses, e-commerce, file transfer protocol issues, you know, things like this. So they had also put a repository or a, a group of things together, okay? Now, some of this stuff is dated, um, you know, like iPlanet Netscape, that's old. Okay, NetBIOS, brute force account, that's all. But you never know, you might have an organization that's still having an um, internal group of systems that use old stuff because in order to keep all their data, they have to maintain those systems um, and then gradually migrate some of the data over to the newer systems, right? And sometimes you can't migrate the data over as that software is no longer supported. So you have to keep those system alive. And so therefore you would run into issues. And so here it lists like a lot of the details about, you know, so this you have to, you can do a search and be able to find some of the things because it's a lot, right? Okay. So that link is here for the, the audit. Now the DNS section, it goes over the purpose of the DNS, which we know that it associates the domain name to the IP and vice versa. 
So when you look at, you know, like google.com, it associates the google.com to an IP address that's public. So we use that for name resolution, but a web server cannot be a web server without its DNS and an, an email server, a web email server like your Gmail or your Yahoo or, you know, even your outlook.com, which is associated with your rccd.edu, um, cannot exist without the DNS, right? Because MX, the Microsoft Exchange server, is always going to use the records that's indicated on the DNS to associate itself to a specific network. And from there, it's going to use Active Directory to load the accounts with the accorded rules. So DNS plays a very important role in the, in the network. And so therefore, when we, when we pen test, we want to take a look at if we're able to de access the DNS records, what kind of records we can access? Can we modify a record using a Python library? Okay. So here, the common use for the DNS protocol, we can look up a domain and it will associate domain name to IP. We can look up an IP and it will associate that IP address to the host name. We can use it to resolve email server. We can use it to query domain information like NSLOOKUP. So to recall the records that you see are IPv4, which is A record, quadruple A, that's for V6, MX for mail, SOA is startup authority. This is for zone and zone transfer where the server is located. You can set it up to various zone. NS is for name of the server. It would associate that, and especially when you're dealing with the subdomain. And then anything for text format, it uses TXT. Um, and that can also use for demarcation and SPF record or demarked and, rec and SPF records in the domain verification. Now, knowing that these, right, can be uh, these can are records inside the DNS. So DNS poisoning is about using a record and modifying the content of that record. For example, how it would associate a domain to an IP. If I want to divert that to a different IP address, I would need to access the record and modify the record. And to prevent that, we learn in security classes that DNSSEC can, is an important area that we can expand to secure our records from being jeopardized. Now on the attacker level, how can you jeopardize those records? You would use the toolkit called DNS Python. This is an open source toolkit. It allows you to query the record. And once you have access to the record, you can modify the record. Okay, now at the detection level, we should be able to see that in the event tracker of our DNS, right? In our Windows case, it would show up under um, the DNS itself and also the security events as logs. Just like any other tool, you need to install the DNS Python. So you need to do a pip3 install DNS Python. And in Tani, it does support. So you would, uh, I'm using an IDE, so I would do a manage package, and then I would do a DNS Python, and I would search for it, and I can click install, and it's going to go. Or I can do on my Windows, I would do a pip3 install, or in my Linux, I would do a pip3 install DNS uh, Python, OK? but I should do it in a virtual environment. Now, the two packages, there it's separate to two packages under that toolkit. You would have a DNS and you would have a DNS resolver. And commonly you would see the DNS resolver, okay? So in the old, when the textbook was written, 
you can use the query method, but in the new library, um, when you run this, your IDE would tell you that you should change query to resolve. It uses a different method to resolve um, the records. Okay, so how do, can you obtain the record? You simply write a statement, you declare, right, a variable that's gonna query or resolve a certain type of record and you would put those records into quotation mark and your domain information in quotation mark. Assuming that I already declare what domain is, that would be like, google.com or microsoft.com and then I can seek for the MX. So when you're using NS lookup, it's really using right a DNS resolver. Okay. In you know, anytime that you're trying to look for the domain, you are actually accessing the method like that. Okay, so the example in example five. It tells you to, uh, here we're using the DNS resolver. We can put in all of these websites, okay? And we would use a for loop to be able to look for its host and we can print out the IP. Okay, let me see. Okay. So here are your domains, and then we can run that, okay? So you notice that when it did this, right, the query, this is from the textbook, it's gonna tell me that, you know, sometimes they time out too when you're trying to resolve. Um, if they're using DNSSEC, it doesn't let you get the record. So you would see that it goes through the exception handling here, okay? So it was going through the O'Reilly and it tells me that um, here I get a, tra a trace back and instead of that, I should use the resolve method, okay? So we need to change the query into the resolve. And it's common that now when you run this, you would likely get some kind of it's going to reach the timeout limitation and it's going to kick it back, okay, if they secure the sites. So if, you do, if you're using it on a vulnerable site, you would see that it's going to come back and it's going to give you more details as you're able to access the record, okay? So here is, oh, that's the next one. Exercise 10. So in the exercise 10, it asks you to use example five and you can simply, you don't have to put in the W, W, W. You can just put in this like this. So we are gonna use rccd.edu, youtube.com and python.org and make sure that we're using resolve instead of query just to handle that, that exception real quick. So you can use example five as a template and we would simply create a list of our domains, okay? And we want to use the resolve method from DNS resolver to be able to get our host A records, which contains IPv4. Okay, so let me clear this and then let's run. And sometimes when it hangs like this, you know that it's gonna, so it's trying to resolve Python, right? And I'm not able to do that. So it's handle the exception. So one, it got, and DNS uses UDP. So when you look at this, you should see that when it got there, right, it, it blocks it. So I have a timeout. So it's gonna come back like this, okay? So it didn't even get to here or here. So if you want, you can do one by one. So when it when it handled the base exception, I didn't get to, to YouTube or the other two, okay? If you're using that script.
Now for number nine, I think I gave you that information already. You can put down query, but it should be that you are going to have to pull the MX, which is for mail. You just declare it as dns.resolver.resolve. And then you will put in the domain like youtube.com and then you put in the records and X and then enclose that in, in the parentheses and then the same thing for here. So let me lowercase that. Okay. And then, then the same thing for this response underscore. Um, we can say that that will be our IPv4. That is DNS dot solver dot resolve. And your domain, so youtube.com and then a records. And if they protect it, it's going to time out, right? Many of the web companies, they do, they, many of the companies, they use web protection. So it won't give you the records. You can, you can um, follow it. You can, you might be able to do NS lookup on it. So if you're using NS lookup, right? So let's see, NS. It's the same thing. Okay, it's able to give you, right, the address information for the Google servers. As it is a child of the google.com. You can see that there. Okay, so we would be able to get information. So for 10, we simply write the script for that. And you saw how that is using example five. We're almost done. So now for 11, we would use example uh, seven of the, the notes. And we want to resolve the public IP 40, 65, 99, 56. So how can you do reverse? And this is called reverse lookup or resolve by IP to a name, right? Not all server have this set up. By default, you when you install DNS, you only gonna have the forward lookup for most part, unless you go through the process to do the reverse lookup. So when on a browser, I can type in this public IP and it should resolve to my domain if I have it set up, okay? Excuse me. So for number 11, you can use example seven, but it looks something like this. So you would import DNS dot reverse name. This is the module in the DNS Python toolkit. Then you would declare a, a domain variable that's going to hold, right? So we are going to use the method from address from this module. And then you simply put your IP address into the um, The parameter there. And then you will print out the domain information because that's what we want to get. And then we also want to print out this. So you can pass it here or you can also do that there. So let me clear this. So what this does is it's going to give you, right, the two address of that domain. And here on the first part, it's going to give you from address. So who is the destination in the source? So if we 
we communicate with this publicly, it's going to pass it to the, the other address. Okay, which is the other server. So that's another way that you can um, look for IP addresses across your domains. And then lastly, fuzzy. So FuzzDB is a database that's gonna contain pattern of known attacks and it's often used in pen testing. So some of the resources, I have a typo here, um, that could be used to test web applications or web servers. A lot of times you're gonna see brute force methods to use because it uses input base. Um, so the number of inputs, right? You keep giving it input. That's basically, if we keep adding inputs, that will be brute force. So example nine, what they're showing is they're using a login.txt file with it. And it's going to append all the login information to a certain website. And basically, it's brute forcing the in, using the input from the, the text file. And it's going to attempt, it's going to run it. So this is just going to brute force the account on this domain. You can also use FuzzDB for SQL injection. And in SQL injection, we simply establish what domain that we're attacking, right? And then we have an empty list that's gonna be your SQL attack. And also we're using an external file. So that's gonna be a text file here. So we are going to use that text file to introduce the input to that server, okay? And those could be queries. So you would have like a certain type of query in order to obtain a certain field or column in a relational database, okay? So that's how you're able to do that. You can always update the text file and keep your script the same Right, so as you try out different queries and that would save time. So to describe FuzzDB, it is a, a group of folders or directory that stores patterns of attack that has been collected over time through pen testing. You can get resources by visiting the GitHub repository for FuzzDB. And there are a lot of video tutorials as well. So we can test the vulnerability and we can test it for our web-based systems like web applications, web servers, or our, even our database. So SQL injection is really aimed toward database, right? Inject to all the queries to get something that you can view or use. Okay. And for your fuzzing process, you first need to identify your target. Look at the number of, or the type of inputs that you need. So some application might take malform inputs, and this is why it's so important for developer to implement sanitation or to sanitize the input, right, as a process in their application or to validate input. That's the first step, validate and then sanitize. Because if so, it creates a, a weakness in our application. So in the case that the application does accept malform input, right, before it goes into sanitation, we can use FuzzDB to generate invalid input and brute force it into the field like user account, password, um, other areas of that application if it has an interface. And fuzzing is a step where we would send that to the target application. We really focus on 
who we're submitting that to, right? Which is the web server and the application server. A lot of time the web server and its associated elements, database, you know, so on. And if it crashed that application or that web application, that means that it's exploitable. Okay, so that's how you would fuss using the steps to really determine exploitability by if it crashes. And for Python, it simply uses fuzzdb module or a toolkit. Any question? Oh, I'm right on time today. Sorry, going all the way till seven. Um, if you have no further questions, you can type your name into the chat and I'll see you on Zoom on Wednesday for the lab. Okay, let me stop recording.